Hello again from Digicore Things. This follows on from my previous video, where I presented and assembled my first prototype PCB of a 6809 CPU card for the MECB bus. Part 1 concluded following the PCB assembly, but prior to testing the successful operation of the CPU card. As we have yet to build an MECB I.O. card, we don't currently have a serial interface available. We in fact don't have any I.O. on our CPU card. We do have our TMS9929A video card, which we built and successfully tested earlier. On my workbench, you can see my MECB backplane with the CPU and video cards vertically inserted and a prototype card inserted on the horizontal connector. I've also connected my logic analyzer to the prototype card's headers and to the CPU card. The reason for this will become apparent shortly. Since my top-down camera doesn't give a good view of the assembled MECB system, I'll give you a slow pan for a better view. So, in order to test the CPU card, my plan has been to do the modern equivalent of what we hobbyists had to do when testing new CPU designs back in the early days. Only a whole lot easier than we had it back then. When I built my first microprocessor-based design, we didn't have computers. So the initial code was hand-assembled, on paper, with a pencil. That's right, we didn't have computers or assemblers, so we wrote raw machine code with pencil and paper. First writing down the CPU's instruction mnemonics, and then manually translating these into the hex byte opcodes and operands needed by the CPU. This also included having to manually count back or forward to calculate branch offsets. We then had to manually enter each byte into our homemade standalone EEPROM programmer. Needless to say, it was a very tedious and time consuming method of program development, with plenty of opportunity for introducing human error to further complicate debugging. Although, it's fair to say, when you eventually created a successfully working solution, it was highly rewarding. Today, we have the huge advantage of computers, enabling easy editing and saving of our source code, and cross-assemblers for automatically generating the required hex object code. Also, cheap and highly capable PROM programmers. In addition, cheap single 5 volt flash ROMs and other electrically erasable ROMs, so we no longer have to use UV erasers for our EEPROMs, or require multi-voltage power supplies for the likes of the early triple supply 2708 EEPROM that I first programmed. So, the plan is to write some assembly code from scratch, assemble it, and program the assembled code into the flash ROM for testing. Effectively, the same process we used in the early days, just a whole lot easier than it was back then. Since I've already tested the TMS9929 VDP card with some Arduino code, the best way forward was to replicate the existing test program into my 6809 CPU card. Basically, by just porting the existing code across to create a ROM-friendly 6809 assembly code version. I've skipped the VDP VRAM testing, as that VDP test has already been done by the Arduino, and our goal now is simply to test the 6809 CPU card. So, the approach I've taken is to rewrite each existing routine that I've developed for the Arduino into an equivalent 6809 subroutine. So let's take a look at the code. Firstly, I define the code entry point as address F000, which puts the code at the beginning of the top 4K of the address space. Then we define the address of the VDP chip. As I'd noted in the header comments, I decided to use the IO request based VDP address allocation. So the CPU card's DIP switch will be used to allocate the E0 page, that is E000 to E0FF, to be the memory mapped IO address space. And the VDP card's address to code will be allocated as the IO space 80 to 87. Therefore, we equate VDP to be the E080 base address, with VDP underscore VRAM and VDP underscore register assigned as the two VDP addresses we will be accessing. Then we have our main entry point of our code, which starts off of the reasonably standard reset initialization of the 6809 system stack pointer, so we can call subroutines, 
in the usual initialization of the direct page register. Before looking at the rest of the mainline code, let's jump ahead to the subroutines. As mentioned earlier, I've simply rewritten the VDP access routines that I originally implemented in the Arduino code. I've named, or labeled, the 6809 subroutines the same as the equivalent Arduino routines for easy association. The code is all relatively straightforward and, as usual, I've clearly documented the code. I'll mention that three of the Arduino equivalent routines are included here only for documentation purposes. As the 6809 equivalent is just a single store or load instruction, clearly we won't bother calling a subroutine just for this, as the store or load instruction itself is quite self-explanatory and would therefore just be coded in line. These are the read status byte VDP, read VRAM byte VDP, and the write VRAM byte VDP routines. The VRAM clear and the VRAM setup routines then follow, which are again quite self-explanatory. Note that both of these routines involve small loops. Finally, we have two delay routines. The first being a simple one millisecond delay, and the second passed a parameter to specify the number of millisecond delays we want. As you'll note from my comments, without a timer available, these delays are achieved via a simple loop, with each instruction execution cycle count noted, and the approximate 1 millisecond subroutine time having been calculated based on a 1 MHz clock. Then, at the end of the ROM, from addresses FFF0 to FFFF, we have our standard 6809 interrupt vectors, of which the reset vector points at our mainline entry address, with the rest of our possible interrupts pointing at a default interrupt handler, which simply immediately returns. And that ends the code. Returning to the mainline code, we first set up the VDP registers, then we clear and set up the VRAM tables. Finally, we loop forever, simply changing the VDP backdrop color every two seconds approximately, just as we did with the Arduino-based VDP card test. Note, my code hasn't in any way been optimized, as for card testing purposes, it makes sense to just keep it simple. Assembling this code into a raw .bin file allows us to program a 28C25632 kilobyte ROM. The resulting bin file is four kilobytes in size, intended to be located in the top 4K of the address space, that is from F000 to FFFF. So we load this into the programmer at buffer location 7000, which equates to the top 4 kilobytes of our 32 kilobyte ROM chip. Once programmed, the ROM was then inserted into the ROM socket on our CPU card. In addition to this, we set the CPU card's 8-way dip switch to indicate we are allocating the E0 page for the memory mapped input output space. Finally, we need to update the EDP card's address decode PAL logic to enable the chip select read and chip select write to be asserted for the IO address block 80287. Let's take a look at that now. Okay, here we have one couple with the standard MECB chip select source code which I'd been through in an earlier video. As you can see, we have the standard input pin assignments and then the three chip select output pin assignments. Next, you can see I've commented out the code that is currently in the PLD chip, which was the direct pass-through, which we used for the Arduino test of the VDP display board. Then I've created a new section which I've labelled as the initial CPU board test with VDP in brackets MECB initial test 09. In this, the first chip select output, chip select 0, is unused, but I've just assigned it to decode the IO address space 80-87. Chip select 1 and chip select 2 are the VDP's chip select read and chip select write signals, and these are simply asserted low when IO request is low and read is low, followed by A7 being high and the remainder of the address lines all being low. And of course CS2, which is chip select write, is the same, only this time it's write 
is low as opposed to read. So that's pretty straightforward. So we compiled that and then we programmed it into the PLD chip. If you want to see how I did all that, then have a look at my earlier video, which explains the use of the PLD chip. So let's get this inserted into the PCB. With the updated PAL chip reinstalled back in the VDP card, we are now ready to apply power and see if our test is successful. This is where it gets interesting. You see, when powered up, the display just stayed blank. So the initial test failed. To be honest, I was pretty happy with this. After all my previous MECB card design tests worked first time, I was actually keen to do some fault finding. So this is what led me to hooking up my logic analyzer in order to help find where I'd gone wrong. In a way, using a logic analyzer does feel like cheating, as I have distinct memories of having to sort out test failures like this in the early days with nothing more than a multimeter and a simple logic probe. These were the only tools available to me and were only good for basic tests and giving me vague clues as to where the problem might be. Actually solving the problem generally came down to going over every detail with a fine tooth comb, rechecking everything until you were able to isolate where either your coding, your design logic or a component had failed. These days a logic analyzer makes zeroing in on the fault so much easier and just like we now have computers and cross assemblers to make life so much easier developing a CPU code, I'd be silly not to take advantage of my modern fault finding tools for debugging my retro designs. Okay, so here's the output from our Logic Analyzer's reset triggered capture. To start off, let me zoom in a little. As you can hopefully now see, I've labeled the 16 signals I'm capturing. This is a 16 channel logic analyzer, so I'm not able to capture all the system signals, so I've omitted the address bus. Instead we are capturing the data bus, reset for our trigger, then the bus clock, memory request, IO request, write, read, and the chip select signals for both the RAM and the ROM. First, we can see that we are getting no activity on the data bus with constant 00, zero bytes. After reset returns high, we should be seeing the reset vector being read from the ROM. We can see the ROM chip select is being asserted, but what is immediately apparent is that the chip select signals do not look right. These signals should be asserted low when memory request is low. Instead, both the ROM and RAM chip select signals are being asserted when memory request is inactive high. So this gives us an obvious clue and that it appears we have an error in our CPU card's power logic. So let's take a look at that. Here's the win couple source for the CPU power logic that I went over in the previous video. Now that we have the vital clue from our logic analyzer, the logic error I've made is plainly obvious. For both of the active low ROM and RAM chip select signals, I'm testing for memory request to be high, instead of requiring memory request to be asserted low. So simply prefixing memory request with a not for both ROM and RAM chip select will resolve this logic error. While I'm at it, I can see a similar logic error for the unused spare chip select. This was intended to follow IO request, but once again I had forgotten the NOT prefix, so that the active low output will follow the active low IO request signal. Not that it really matters as this output is unused. So with these changes made, I'll recompile the code and reprogram the CPU card's PAL chip. With the updated PAL chip reinstalled back in the CPU card, let's power up to see if we now have success and take a look at the updated sample from our logic analyzer. Here's the updated sample from our logic analyzer. Once again, I'll zoom in a little so it's easier to read. Now we can see that the chip select ROM signal looks more appropriate. 
and importantly we can now see the expected activity on the data bus. We can see the F000 reset vector being loaded and the code being read and executed. If I scroll along a bit you can now also see the return address for the first subroutine call being written to the stack and RAM and also the first byte being written to the VDP via our IO request. So let's take a look at our display. Yes, we have success. We now have our 6809 CPU card successfully working with the VDP card, running our VDP display code, displaying what we previously saw from our Arduino driven VDP card test. Awesome. We're now well on our way to a standalone MECB system once we add an IO card. That's it. Thanks for watching.